Hi, I am Marco Lisi. I work for the European Space Agency. I was a former special advisor of the European Commission on Space Policies, and I am presently advisor of the European GNSS Agency, GSA, in Prague. I will give you in this presentation a summary of the history of navigation technologies from Ulysses, actually from cavemen, to the present uh, global navigation satellite systems, GPS, GLONASS, and Galileo. The, one of the fundamental questions of mankind was uh, when and where are we? Not just where, but also when. The need to locate yourself in space and also in time. Of course, the following question is, where are we going? And this is a very old question, a very old problem. Since the prehistoric times, the, in, the cavemen tried to find a way to uh, locate their position and to somehow get back to some places. One problem was that, for instance, of finding their way back to places where they knew they could hunt well, there were places frequented by animals, and where they could find uh, easily their prey. What did they use uh, in those times? They used some references. They were probably also uh, signing their uh, position with branches or with the stones, and they were also making reference to some uh, geographical uh, um, reference points like mountains or big trees. But it is important that uh, as soon as the first uh, men try to get back to a place, to a home, maybe it was a cave, that started the uh, transition from a purely nomadic type style of life to a sedentary type uh, lifestyle. And that was, in fact, the, the start of the civilization as we know it uh, now. In the early days, the problem of navigation was particularly uh, important for sailors. One way to avoid uh, having problems was to sail very close to the coast and uh, stopping at night, and maybe even uh, coasting at night, and, uh, and uh, unless uh, they had to uh, get far from the coast, and then uh, uh, they started using the stars as the, as the reference. Uh, they understood that uh, there were stars that were uh, looking different in different points of the Earth, so observing the stars at night, they could uh, somehow guess uh, their position and, and also obtain uh, their direction uh, to go uh, back home or to wherever they wanted to go. So this uh, method of using stars to navigate uh, has been uh, the fundamental method for many centuries. Uh, unfortunately, the stars are visible, only, well visible only at night and only in good weather conditions. The uh, use of stars uh, to navigate uh, is also reported in literature. One of the classics of the uh, uh, Greek literature, the poem, the Odyssey, the poem of Homer, uh, speaks about Odysseus navigating from the island of Ogigia, that was the island of the Calypso nymph, going to Ithaca, and Ulysses is uh, said to follow the advice of the goddess Athena that suggested him to keep the great bear constellation, the Ursa Major constellation, on his left side. So uh, we know for sure that uh, the use of stars in navigation is at least uh, some 3,000 uh, years old, but surely even older. The situation stayed for centuries, actually almost millennia, and the first technological breakthrough in navigation is constituted by the invention and the adoption of the magnetic compass. The history of the magnetic compass is very controversial. 
First of all, the magnetic compass is an instrument that points toward the north or better to the magnetic north. Um, and the importance of this uh, instrument is that uh, it doesn't depend on uh, the time of the day and it doesn't depend on weather. So it, somehow there was for the first time a way to get rid of uh, the stars and to get uh, some indication, maybe approximate, about uh, your uh, position and direction. The origins of the compass uh, is uh, somehow mysterious. Some people think that it was invented by the Chinese, uh, but and there are some uh, arguments in favor of this, uh, of this uh, opinion. Uh, some others instead think that it was invented by the Arabs, or better, maybe the Arabs imported the, the technology from China into the Mediterranean Sea. Other think, uh, people think that they were, it was invented by the Norsemen, uh, but uh, also there is a, a strong opinion that uh, it was invented in uh, Italy, uh, in the um, um, city of uh, Amalfi, that was at that time one of the uh, famous uh, republics uh, that was dominating uh, the, the, the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, in the Middle Age. Uh, it is for sure anyhow that the, uh, the, the use of the compass is reported in Europe uh, around the year 1000 and the actual shape of the compass is, uh, uh, was uh, reached around the 13th century. And someone names even uh, the, the person that uh, invented the, the compass as it is uh, today, Flavio Gioia from the city of Amalfi. Uh, uh, this slide shows uh, one example of very of ancient uh, compass developed by Chinese. It was a sort of spoon that is magnetized and it is pointing somehow to, toward the north. So it isn't, doesn't look really like the compass we have in mind uh, today, and uh, it gives you just an approximate uh, uh, position of the north. Uh, while the uh, compass as uh, uh, we know today, it is uh, somehow an instrument. Uh, this was probably the real uh, invention of uh, Flavio Gioi of Amalfi. He applied to the compass the uh, wind rose or wind star that made the, uh, the compass a real instrument because it was possible somehow to get a better measurement of the direction as compared to, to the north. Uh, you see on the slide the one a very old example of wind rose. Uh, and uh, you might ask why the, 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 the winds take this name. Some, uh, it is difficult to understand why certain winds take names that are linked to uh, places in the Mediterranean, like Greece or Syria. And uh, one should think that the center of the wind rose in those times was the island of Malta. And, uh, and if you locate the wind rose in the island of Malta, then the meaning of the, uh, of the wind rose is evident, and it's also evident why the wind took uh, certain names. Then uh, for uh, many other centuries, uh, navigation was based on the observation of the stars that was uh, kept alive, of course knowledge of the uh, sea currents and winds, the use of uh, the compass, uh, and a meticulous care in the compilation of the uh, ship logbook. Uh, that altogether made uh, a type and approach to navigation that is uh, used even uh, these days, uh, that is called estimated navigation or dead reckoning. One example of uh, a brilliant uh, user of this technique, uh, a really genial user of this technique, is uh, uh, Cristoforo Colombo, 
And uh, this is evident reading the chronicles of his journey. This uh, guy was able, with the very limited instrumentation available uh, at, at those times, to trace uh, his uh, path, let's say, his track to the, to the new world with an incredible precision for, that, uh, for those times. And uh, then uh, a, a further step in the uh, technology was uh, uh, linked to the development of the uh, sextant. But uh, to go to the sextant, uh, we, have, we had to go through some uh, original instruments. Uh, one was an Arabian uh, type, a very rudimental type of, uh, of uh, sextant uh, called Kamal. It was based on a little piece of uh, tablet of wood with uh, a rope and uh, with some nodes. And it allowed the, the, the sailor to somehow recognize uh, the latitude of his position by looking at the fixed star, it could have been the North Pole, uh, as compared to the horizon. Uh, other instruments used in those times were the astrolabs. And then the quadrant, uh, at the beginning it was not a sextant, it was a quadrant because it was actually covering 90 degrees. Then it developed into an octant, 80 degrees and then down to the 60 degrees of the sextant that uh, we use even in, uh, in these days. Uh, in those times, uh, there were, uh, the, the, the astronomy was very important, uh, and there were uh, important astronomers that actually developed uh, in, in Europe uh, and exported their uh, knowledge and technology even uh, abroad. So it is surprising that in the 16th century China of the uh, Ming emperors, the most important, the first astronomer at the court of uh, the, the Ming emperor was in fact an Italian, an Italian uh, monk um, of the Jesuit uh, uh, order, uh, Matteo Ricci. And uh, today, even today, in the Beijing, uh, you can see the uh, ob uh, astronomical uh, observatory of Matteo Ricci that is kept as it was originally in the 16th century. Now the sextant. The sextant uh, is uh, the, the another important development in, te in the navigation technology and it was invented in uh, 1732. It used a system of mirrors to measure the exact angle of stars or moon or sun above the horizon. Uh, the sextant was originally used only to determine the latitude. So, in other words, the position on the Earth as compared to the north or, uh, or south uh, against the position of the equator. The, the most important problem for seamen was instead that of uh, calculate their longitude. In other words, the position on the Earth, east or west, of a reference meridian. The problem got very important, especially when, uh, with the developments of, uh, of uh, the, the New World, the colonies in the New World, uh, it was very important for uh, England. Uh, they had to guarantee the safety of their uh, ships uh, reaching the America, and not knowing exactly their uh, longitude, uh, their risk is, was very high. It was very easy to um, make mistakes about your, uh, their position such that uh, the, the end result were disasters uh, and uh, with a big loss of uh, goods and, uh, and uh, human lives. So the problem was so important that uh, the, the British Kingdom and, uh, and uh, government somehow instituted a group of experts through a law, the so-called Longitude Act. Uh, these scientists and experts constituted the so-called Longitude Board to find the solution. Uh, in fact, the, the problem was so difficult that they decided to offer a big prize it was 20,000 20, pounds of those times that today would be equivalent to some $1 million, so a huge amount of money, 
to whoever was able to uh, prove, uh, to, to find the method to determine the longitude of a ship in open water, so without any reference, uh, with an accuracy of approximately 30 nautical miles that are equivalent to 55 kilometers. This was considered a safe accuracy to guarantee that uh, no uh, disasters uh, could occur for a ship, for instance, sailing uh, to the New World or back from the New World to, to England. Uh, there were several people that uh, tried to solve the problem with uh, solutions very fancy and, uh, and uh, some, sometimes even uh, really surprising. But uh, eventually the, the problem was, in fact, and the prize was awarded to a, an artisan that was uh, working uh, almost in his spare time, Mr. Harrison, John Harrison, in 1761, who developed a clock. And you could ask yourself, uh, how is a clock solving the problem of longitude? And the problem uh, instead was uh, actually solved by a very precise clock. Because uh, as soon as uh, you are able, it is easy to uh, measure uh, in, uh, when you are sailing uh, the, uh, the astronomical midday. Uh, you just measure the height of the sun above the horizon and you find uh, the highest point, the time when the sun is highest over the horizon. And that is your astronomical midday uh, in your position. If you are able to compare your uh, midday time to the same time uh, in the original place where you started from, and you see the difference that, of course, exists between the two, uh, the two measurements, then you can immediately derive the uh, difference in degrees, the, the longitude, as compared to the meridian of your starting location. The problem is to have a clock that is very stable and that is not accumulating big errors over a certain period of time. Uh, to go from England to the New World, it took uh, several days, between uh, two and three months on navigation. And so the clocks of, the, of those times were not accurate enough. And when they were getting close to the final destination, for instance, in the New World, in America, the, the error in the measurement was such uh, that uh, the longitude uh, derived with this method was not uh, reliable. Mr. Harrison managed to develop a clock so precise that it was deviating of no more than one second per day. And this is exactly, by the way, the definition of uh, the marine chronometer. When we uh, read on some clocks of a certain class that they are certified chronometers, this means uh, no more that, uh, and making reference to the original definition of uh, Harrison, that they deviate uh, no more than one second from the true time, one second per day. Harrison, you see it uh, in, uh, in this slide, developed over the years uh, different models of his uh, very accurate clock. He developed uh, very refined techniques to make the, the, his clocks more and more stable and accurate. Uh, in, uh, in the slide you see the four models that are named uh, from uh, his name, Harrison 1, 2, 3 and 4. The fourth one is in fact a pocket clock and uh, one, a clock like this was used by Captain Cook in his exploration of uh, the islands uh, of the, uh, around Australia. And uh, someone says that when he was killed by the, uh, the population there during his last uh, trip, uh, he had uh, with him one of these clocks, one Harrison 4 pocket clock, very precise chronometer. Then uh, navigation in the 18th and 19th centuries uh, relied mainly on chronometers and sextants 
to get uh, a fairly good approximation of latitude and longitude. It has to be taken into account that for long uh, sea voyages, uh, however, even uh, precise chronometers uh, were accumulating uh, a fairly uh, large error. And uh, it is important to think that uh, four minutes of error uh, accumulated by a chronometer was translating uh, in uh, approximately one degree of error in the longitude determination one degree in longitude being equivalent to approximately 100 kilometers if you are close to the equator. So the mistake was uh, that you were uh, achieving was uh, rather large, uh, even uh, with uh, fairly accurate uh, type of instrument. The next breakthrough in technology came uh, at the end of the uh, um, uh, 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century with the introduction of radio waves and the idea of using uh, sources of uh, radio waves as uh, a reference to uh, um, determine your position and to help uh, uh, navigation. So with the introduction of so-called radio navigation systems. And these systems uh, developed a lot uh, at the beginning of the 20th century and they were uh, got the uh, wide use, uh, especially during the Second World War. The idea of a radio direction uh, finding or radio direction finder, RDF, was actually developed uh, at the Marconi company in the, at the beginning of the 20th century and was then refined and used both on ships and airplanes and it became uh, uh, so widespread that in 1931 the system was, uh, uh, became mandatory for all vessels with a tonnage of uh, 5,000 tons or more. In, uh, on 30th of July 1934, uh, in uh, Sestri Levante, near Genoa in Italy, Marconi, the inventor of radio, he tried to really prove that radio waves were able to offer a, a very powerful uh, mean for navigating at sea. And uh, he actually called his technique blind navigation. Uh, he organized an experiment with, uh, on board his yacht Electra, from which he was performing several important experiments. On that day, that was uh, uh, the, the experiment was then reported by the international press, um, especially in, uh, in UK. Uh, he uh, had several experts and experts on navigation and, and technicians on board his yacht. And uh, he proved that he could, uh, in a completely blind way, so he was covering with curtains uh, the, the cockpit of his, uh, of his uh, yacht, he could move uh, very precisely in between uh, two buoys that were uh, put installed along the coast and spaced apart uh, some uh, uh, hundred meters uh, one from the other, using uh, the uh, reference from uh, a transmitter that was on the coast transmitting at the frequency of about 500 megahertz. So in the slide you can see on one side uh, the laboratory of uh, Marconi on board this yacht and on the other the yacht itself going through the buoys and uh, his position along the coast with the position of the beacon, the radio beacon on, uh, on uh, the coast in Sestri Levante. We can really say that on that uh, day of July 1934 the, the idea of uh, using uh, radio signals to navigate uh, was really born. So we can call it the birth of uh, radio navigation. And radio navigation developed over the years uh, and became a technology that is uh, even today uh, so important and helpful in our everyday life and uh, saving so many thousands of lives. In the, from the Marconi experiments, uh, uh, until uh, uh, the mid of the 20th century, the technology evolved and uh, some uh, uh, systems for navigation based on uh, 
on uh, radio waves that were developed. So there were evolution of the uh, initial uh, radio direction finding uh, RDF techniques. Uh, systems like, uh, especially during the Second World War, some more sophisticated systems were developed, like, for instance, the Loran A, then became uh, Loran C, or uh, systems like Decca and Omega. They were called hyperbolic systems. They were based on uh, radio uh, sources uh, on ground and uh, gave uh, fairly good accuracy in the orders of uh, some hundreds or tens of meters to, uh, to the, for navigation. And of course, uh, they were requiring uh, a large number of, uh, of stations, uh, mainly along the coast. Uh, there was a need, though, for a, a truly global coverage system and uh, with uh, even better uh, localization accuracy. And this was not uh, fulfilled, uh, completely fulfilled uh, through uh, the uh, systems uh, developed so far. So the, the, the following breakthrough, the one that uh, led to the development of the present global navigation satellite systems, came on the 4th of October 1957, with the launch of the first artificial satellite, Sputnik 1. And one could ask himself why, how is Sputnik linked to the development of uh, global navigation satellite systems? Not just because it was the first artificial satellite, but about what happened after the launch of Sputnik 1. After Sputnik 1 was launched, and we should remind ourselves that Sputnik 1 was broadcasting a very simple radio signal uh, at around 20 megahertz. Uh, many scientists around the world, mainly in the United States, started receiving the signal from Sputnik 1, trying also to understand to, to, to more about Sputnik and how it was working. And some uh, uh, scientists tried uh, at the Applied Physics Laboratory of the John Hopkins University to measure, through measurements of the Doppler effect uh, uh, measured on the uh, signal, the radio signal received from uh, Sputnik 1, to derive information about uh, the orbit of the satellites itself. It's obvious that when the Doppler was getting minimum, that was the, the closest point uh, of Sputnik as compared to the position of the receiver. But in fact, you could integrate the information over time, and the slowly, slowly, they managed to develop techniques uh, to reconstruct uh, the orbit of the satellite. This was very, very important. At one point, one of the scientists thought that the approach could be reversed. In other words, if someone knew very exactly the orbit of the satellites, for a user on ground measuring the, its uh, Doppler uh, error uh, uh, on a, a radio signal broadcasted from the satellite, he could derive its accurate position on ground. So it was from the initial observation on uh, on Sputnik uh, that started the idea of using uh, uh, satellites uh, to derive the position of a user on, uh, on the Earth. Uh, in particular, just one year after the launch of Sputnik 1 in 1958, it started the first uh, satellite navigation project, Transit. Uh, its formal name was Navy Navigation Satellite System. Uh, it was funded, of course, by the Navy, the U.S. Navy, and uh, this system uh, um, was developed by the Advanced Research Project Agency, ARPA, that then uh, became uh, DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. Transit uh, consisted of a constellation of six satellites in a polar orbit, and they were uh, orbiting at about 600 nautical miles of altitude. There were three ground control stations uh, and uh, some very bulky at that time uh, user receivers. Uh, it entered in service in 1964 uh, and it was made available later on also to commercial ships and aircrafts 
everywhere in the world. Uh, the, the system uh, kept being operational for many years uh, until uh, 1996, when it was retired after more than uh, 32 years of continuous and rather successful service. But in the meantime, uh, another uh, system was developing, and that was uh, uh, the GPS Global Positioning System. I'm not going here to make the detailed history of GPS. That would take uh, no, another full uh, presentation or more than just one more presentation. But uh, we can see what is the situation today. Today we have uh, not just GPS, but also another operational uh, uh, satellite-based system that is GLONASS, the Russian GLONASS, and other two are being developed, the Galileo, European Global Navigation Satellite Systems, and uh, the Chinese Beidou. So today the technology is uh, uh, widespread and uh, very important uh, to support so many applications in our, in our life. What uh, is going to be uh, in the future, to happen in the future? Uh, in the future, we have uh, uh, to think about uh, a integration of the uh, uh, global navigation satellite systems among themselves and an integration of these systems with other big uh, system of systems, for instance, uh, uh, um, supporting uh, air traffic management or supporting earth observation. And even uh, far away into the future, we have to think uh, about uh, navigating in our uh, solar system. And some researchers are already studying uh, uh, satellite uh, navigation systems that will uh, allow the navigation in our uh, solar systems for planetary type of uh, missions uh, and maybe in the future even further beyond. And these systems could be based on uh, X-ray pulsars uh, stars.